Hey neighbor, welcome to the show. We got a good one for you today. We got Wendell here from Monterey and Monterey is our pest control line here. We're going to give you some great insights on controlling those pests and diseases in that vegetable garden. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful to have you, Wendell. Good to be here. Been a while since you've been with us. It has been. Yep. It and we been. thought, what a better time. We, we are in February. Now, we time to get seeds started, but we're going to sit back and we're going to talk about some things that's probably going to come due a little bit later in the growing season, is bugs and disease. Right. Everybody uh, has somewhat problem with bugs, disease. I, used, I gave a talk uh, one time in Pennsylvania to an organic gardening crowd. And I told them, I said, look here in the south, we got bugs and diseases y'all have never seen before. That's right. So it's a little bit different down here in the deep yeah. south with our with our winters like it is. But we're going to give you all some great insight today. Wendell's a load of information on, on this kind of stuff here. Been in the business a little while? Just a little bit. How long? Uh, about uh, 32 years on this and yep. in the industry for about... Almost 50 years. Yeah. So been a while. Yep. Been a while. So uh, it's going to be a good show. First of all, I want to talk about a new product that I mentioned the other night on our live. We did a live the other night, which is a little different. And I wanted to bring it up again. Yeah. New product, we got some new things. This right here is a 128 tray that we just got in here. It's exactly the same width and dimensions. I say width, width and length of our 128 and 332, but the sails are bigger. This is a 128, it's a little bit taller, and the sails in there is a little bit bigger. So if you're looking for a good seed start tray, you're excited to have these in, they will last you all your life. Number one, another thing, we got Clipso Cucumber back in stock. We've had a hard time with Clipso Cucumber, but we got it back in and uh, proud of that. And we're pre-selling turmeric. Turmeric, we went live with that last weekend. And if you don't know what turmeric is, do you a Google search on it. It's a lot of health benefits to it. It's fun to grow. We started selling it last year. And uh, we've sold a bunch of it last few days. We're going to have it for to ship around. We're going to start shipping it out around the middle of March. So turmeric, you want to grow you a few few uh, hills of that. You can grow it in a container, or you can grow it in a raised bed, or you can grow it on a flat either one. It needs just one thing I did learn last year. It needs a little bit of shade. It seems to do better in shade. It's a heavy feeder, but you can grow your own turmeric. And you may ask, well, why do I want to grow my own turmeric? If you buy the dried turmeric or the turmeric powder in the grocery store or whatever, more than likely just about all of our turmeric powder comes from overseas. And they've been tested, there's some heavy metals in some of that. So you don't know exactly what you get in there, but if you grow your own turmeric, you know exactly what you got. All right, so let's get into what is going on in the garden. And uh, right now we're in the middle of seed starting right now. I've got my pepper started, and my tomato started. I got brassicas going on in there. It's Johnny Get Your Gun on seed and start for us here in the South. That's right. <clears throat> now, Wendell, tell me you grow a big garden every year. I'd like to tell you that, but <laughs> my, my business don't allow me to do that because I don't get to spend enough time at home. But, yeah. But I grew up doing doing it and uh, just want to get back to that at some point in my life. Yeah. I don't well, get maybe, to grow a big garden. Maybe, maybe in that retirement, out. that'll work until you retire. Yeah, maybe you one know? of these days. Yeah, that'll be a <laughs> hobby you take on. But, uh, <clears throat> Monterey, tell us just a little bit about Monterey. They're based out of California. We, we, we're right. not proud of that, but it's a fact. Well, that's it. It's kind of it's kind of strange when I first went to work with them and uh, went out there to in interview with them. And everybody you see here in the southeast, and you talk to them, and they say, well, where are you based out of? And you say California, and they look at me, and they say, no, you're not from <laughs> California. But but anyway, they are based in Fresno, California. Our parent company is an ag company uh, out of Springfield, Illinois, Brandt, uh, Consolidated. They own, they own us and we are the Lawn and Garden Division. For Which the is basically an agricultural company. It is an yeah. agricultural company, yes, it is. Cool. Right. So we got some programs we're going to lay out to you, Dave. First of all, I need to do this right here. I need to talk about potatoes just for a minute and I got yeah. to do my blade thing. There you go. They love right my blade thing. One, <laughs> I started doing this about three weeks ago. We got a few potatoes left, not many seed potatoes. They, they're going quick. We don't have all the ones that we had at one time. We sold out some varieties. But if you want your potatoes, you better look through there and see what you can get and get them because they're going to be gone in a hurry and we're not getting them more back in. All right, blade of the week, folks. I did a little couple of uh, 
I did a case and I think I did a uh, uh, Uncle Henry last week, folder knives. This is the first time I'm going to do a fixed blade knife. This right here, folks, is a company called Bart River Knives. It makes semi-production knives out of up north, I believe Wisconsin or somewhere. But isn't that a pretty that's knife? A nice knife. Yeah, I believe that's, I don't know what kind of handle that is. That's some kind of wood. You can see the imperfections in it right there. Right. Yeah. That's some type of curly maple handle right there. But this is A2 tool steel right here. And this company in my book makes a wonderful fixed blade knife here. And uh, USA made, of course, very, very sharp. Yeah, scary sharp. But uh, it's a good knife. They do good leather sheaths there. So check out Bart River Knives. I get absolutely nothing off of that. But I bought a few of these. I got a few of them that, uh, that I have. And I'll, for a semi-production knife company, USA made knife, good knife. It's not outrageously expensive, but it's not cheap, but the leather sheath is really nice here. I got a few of these right here. I had to make myself quit buying them, but uh, <laughs> I, got, I got more than I'll ever need. But anyhow, Bart River Knives, folks, check it out. All right, so let's get into the nitty, nitty gritty. We've got a garden spotlight we're going to do at the end of the show, but let's get into what are pesticides. Now, a lot of people, they get the words pesticides, insecticides, fungicides all mixed up. So let's talk about what is a pesticide. A pesticide is just something that kills pests. Correct. Now, pests could be whatever. Dog, cat. Well, to us, it could be. It could be. be. It could it could be. be. Right. Now, we it don't want to kill no, dogs no, 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 and cats, no, 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 but no, no, no. a pest is anything that causes you a problem, and you consider it a pest. Now, the side part of that word there, in Latin, side means to kill. So you got pesticides. So that is a general term, pesticide, that covers just about anything. Well, now, we break down from that, and then we got insecticides. That's correct. Which means to kill insects. insects. And then we got fungicides which means to kill fungi, but we call those disease control. That's correct. And then we've got herbicides, and herbicides is to kill weeds. To make it just a little bit more complicated than that, if you draw down from herbicides, then you got post-emergent herbicides and pre-emergent herbicides. That's correct. Post-emergent herbicides are the ones that kill, that's got, it's got foliage already, it's already emerged. If that is weed is in existence, you want to use what they call a post-herbicide to kill that. Pre-emergent herbicide is just what it says there. It keeps that weed seed from emerging. So you get it early on, kind of what we call preventative. Now, there are other sides out there. Uh, what is our Sluggo Plus? What is that considered? Do you remember? That's a mulicide. Mulicide. Yeah. Yep. So, so there's a lot of more of them out there. We're going to stick with these, these three or four that we talked about right there because you can get in all kind of sides. You can. That's correct. I mean, I don't want to break it up, but think about the word genocide. That's right. Genocide means yeah. to kill, but it was on a, a bad note yeah, there. But yeah, note. that's yeah. right. That's right. So side. Remember, side in Latin means to kill. So even if you're using Dawn dishwasher detergent, folks, that's a pesticide because you're killing a pest with that right there. So anything that you kill a pest with is considered a pesticide. All right. So since we've moved on with that, let's get talk, started talking about tomatoes and peppers. Now, I know it's early on for you guys out there to be thinking about, but if you've grown tomatoes and peppers before, you know you're going to have problems. And uh, when on a tomato and pepper disease program, let's talk about what your recommendation would be. Okay, on, on the... Uh, and I'm going to be digging <clears throat> them out over here as you, as you talk okay. about because we got a lot of stuff to cover. We have a... Uh, they have some new products that's been introduced in the market over the last probably 10, 12, 15 years. And, uh, and it's actually, uh, they're biofungicides and they're bioinsecticides. And uh, the fungicide we have is complete disease control. And you know the one and, that we didn't uh, get of all of them we there picked it is. up? Here it is right here. Oh, okay. That's I thought we right missed here. it right yep. there. All right. That is, uh, that is a biofungicide and it is an organic. It was uh, derived from a, a strand of bacteria and uh, it is a bacteria and it just it takes care of the fungus problems in a natural way and uh, you can use that as a foliar spray to take care of a lot of your airborne funguses and you can use it as a drench to take care of a lot of your uh, soil funguses and uh, it's just been a, a really good product to be used a lot of people want to use organics nowadays i mean you we're seeing that more and more especially with the younger people and uh, they're really educated on the, the uh, organics and they want to use something that's safe for the 
for the children and safe for the pets and safe for the planet. Sure. So therefore they want to use that. And even though you do have to use most of your organics a little more often than you do your synthetics, but uh, we do offer, these are two of the best ones we offer. We actually offer this Monterey Complete Disease. It does really well as far as uh, as far as your most all of your funguses and then also the fungi max is going to be a synthetic it's not an organic it is synthetic but it still has a label on there that where you can use it on fruits and vegetables and lawns and berries and you can use almost everything there's just what we call a withdrawal period from harvest so uh, what is a withdrawal we, we we hear that a lot people people really get hung up on that so on every label is what we call a r is it rei that's it that's it. And it and it will tell you on in, in some things it's it's you know, it's a little more technical than I can get, but on some things it's only one day, some day it's some things it's three days, some day it's some things it's seven days, some it's twenty one days. Uh most of our organic products are in a green label and all of our most all of our synthetics are in our orange label. So that for you can kind of distinguish between the two. But most of the organics there's not a long withdrawal period at all. One, and sometimes it can be different per crop. That's it, and it, that's right for a crop. You, you, you're exactly right on that. And and two, but most of them are on the uh, organics. Most of them you can use today and, and harvest tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So there's no withdrawal period. But it does tell you, and it does, it don't get intimidated by those labels because they, we try to be as specific as we can to, to let a consumer know that, you know, how long if they spray in Fungi Max on peppers, how long it, you know, they need to withdraw from harvest, do it before you harvest. And then, of course, like I said, on the organics, that's one of the reasons that a lot of people are going to organics. They like the idea of being able to uh, harvest the same day or the next day. So uh, that is a biofungicide. It's done a really, really good job. One of the good things about that on the peppers, uh, especially, I mean, on the peppers, but on tomatoes, is tomatoes tend to have some blights early and late and it's hard to find the fungicide that will take care of both the early and the, and the late blight that one there does both and so you told me one time it actually does have a little bit of uh activity on tomato spotted with tomato tomato spotted with virus <laughs> it does it so, does it does so it's got a lot of different funguses on the label uh we do recommend that you use once you transplant then you let the tomato uh, peppers whatever you're transplanting get established you know, over a period of time, you can go in and apply this and then reapply it, you know, every five to seven days after it gets about three, four weeks old. Early blight and late blight is a tremendous problem on our tomato plants. It, it is. So do you recommend you using this as a drench or as a foliar for those, the, for those the reason blights? I, yeah, the reason I say drench now, it, you do need to do it as a foliar application also during the season, but as a drench early on, it actually... If you can get it down, and you can, you can get it down to the root system, and it actually, that bacteria colonizes itself around the root, and it stops a lot of those diseases from coming out of the soil into the plant itself. So you, you're actually doing a lot of preventative, and that's another thing about a lot of the organics. A lot of them are, are what we call controls. I mean, they do, some of them have curative properties, which this one does have some curative properties, but it's really uh, like a maintenance type mm -hmm. uh, product you use. You're going to have to use it a little bit more often, but... Uh, most people don't mind doing that, and they realize they're going to have to do that. They're going to use organics. So the way I did this was I took me a five-gallon bucket, and I drilled me a small hole in the bottom of it. Right. And I mixed this up in a slurry in my five-gallon bucket and just set it beside my plants, and I would go through there and move my bucket. That way, it didn't run off. It would gradually just cool. soak in around that root system there. So that good seemed idea. to work pretty good for me on that. That is a good idea. Uh, you could put it through your injector system, but it's hard to get enough of it through your injector through the tape there to do to do what you That's need it right. to do. That's so right. so I don't really recommend it for that. It's more of a, a drench thing. Right. The problem with drenches is a runoff. That's right. So that's the reason I found that five gallon bucket with a little bit of hole in there that's works right. really good on that. <clears throat> so this product right here <clears throat> come out in the not, late 1990s, not 1998, 99, somewhere there. Am I right there? Probably so because I know that uh Spinosad, we'll talk about in a little bit, which is a bio uh, insecticide. Mm -hmm. It actually came out and they developed it and found it. They found it and developed, I guess you could say, in 1985. So yeah, it was probably in the, in the it, was, it was probably in the 90s, early so, 2000s. If I'm not mistaken, this right here was developed by a company called AgriQuest in California. 
And I, when I remember when they discovered this and they got it in production, I listened to the lady, NPR did an interview with her one day, and this was in the 90s. Yeah. And I remember hearing them talk about this particular biofungicide, and it was really interesting to me at the time. Who knew 20-something years later would be selling the product? That's it. That's it. One good thing about this right here, it has no resistance. That's it. So that's the that's reason this works so great in a rotation. It has no resistance. As we see with these synthetics, a lot of times we get resistance built up to that's those. Right. Yeah, so that's the importance that. with this complete disease control. It has no resistance. So that's it works right. really good with any program with a rotation there. That's correct. Extremely safe. That is correct. And as the word says, complete disease control. If it's got one weakness, it's probably late blight. It's maybe not as strong on late blight as early blight. Possibly, but but it it does have you know it does have both on the label, and right. that's been the most effective thing we've found for both of them. Mm -hmm. I have problem with early blight is right. my biggest right. problem here, but yeah, blights are a big one out there. Fungus Max is also good for rust on beans. It sure is. The the difference between those two also not besides them being uh, you know synthetic and organic. It's Fungimax is going to be a systemic, mm -hmm. and then the complete disease control is really not a systemic. Explain system. to them what, how the systemic, what a systemic is, and how that works. Well, it, with a systemic, some of them are recommended to take up through which now complete disease does get you know colonized around the root system, but it don't go up into the plant. Right, didn't work through the xylem or the right. bloodstream of the plant. But it being systemic will either once you spray it on the foliage or either you drench around it, it is taken up into the plant itself. And the non-systemics are going to be your going to be your contact fungicides, which is going right. to be like the complete. And disease. when we say systemic, we automatically know that it's going to protect for longer. That's exactly. It's going to hang around it a little will. bit longer, up to two weeks. Matter of fact, on that's right. Max. And, a, and a lot of people get a little excited about when you say systemic. They worried about it getting into fruit. You don't have to worry about that because, there, like I said, there's a, a two week, there's a seven seven day seven day waiting period on most vegetables on the Fungi Max, and you are good to go, and so there's no problem with that at all. Yeah. But it's just basically whatever you want to choose to use. Uh, if you'd rather use an organic, that complete disease is great. And, and you said one day on this right here. Yes. One yes. day, yeah. so you can harvest one day after you That's treat it. With that. That's it. That is yep. it. So if you got tomatoes, you want to grow tomatoes, you definitely want to have that work within your your system right there that is that's correct. my opinion that, on that. that is correct all right so let's get into tomato and pepper insect mite control and we throw fungus control in there too because some of these work both ways right that's all right. right let me dig out over here what we need to get we need to get neem oil which is a lot of buzz out there around neem oil but folks i'm going to tell you these different kinds of neem oil that's right? correct. i will let there you go Expand there is different kinds of different qualities of neem oil. We do pride ourselves in carrying the, the highest quality that's available. Uh, the ours is, the I guess the technical name would be Trilogy Formulation. It's actually processed and refined and it's refined to a point where they take a lot of the toxins out of it. And it just, it just does a better job. We can actually, it's just like all the rest of them, you want to, you know, you want to be careful on your, uh, the heat. It up to 90 degrees and you want to back off and then let it cool down a little bit before you spray but uh but the neem oil is just a really high quality neem oil and uh it does a good job it's got miticide properties it's got insecticide properties and it's got fungicidal properties so it actually is a three-way mix uh if you've got a real bad problem with fungus before you you know if you have a pretty bad problem before you realize you have fungus it's not as good to use. It's better to use something like Complete Disease or use fungi, especially Fungimax. Uh, it'll take care of it a lot quicker. But neem is more of a maintenance, maintenance type. So it just it. coats the leaf basically and it keeps does. that disease from entering. At least it kind of protect it. It does. It does. And uh, like I said, it takes care of a lot of insects by suffocation, and it also works on the the mites. It's got a good good broad label on mites, and then it also works on a lot of your different funguses, especially if you want to do it as a preventative, because you know if you in the south, if you like you said before, if you grow, you're gonna have problems with fungus, and you're gonna have problems with insects and with mites. So if you do that on a regular basis, it does does work out. It will yeah, kill just about anything if you get the coverage on it. That's correct. But you got to make sure when you spray in that foliage that you spray top of the leaf and underneath the leaf and the stalk. Yeah, mm -hmm. give a good, good thorough coverage. Of the Two point of drip off. When you see that dripping off there and you got complete coverage, it's time to stop at that point. That's right. That's right. But uh, Nemo can can it be sprayed during any time of the day? 
it need again you need to be careful with that heat restriction okay there is a 90 degree and that's pretty much across the board on early in the morning or late in the afternoon that's correct that's the best time to, mm -hmm. to spray that yes. is the best time yes. what about mixing neem oil with everything else that you sell as far as what i know you can we can mix neem with anything any combination of these insecticides or fungicides or not as far as i know yes you can yep. you can yes yeah, I don't know of any restrictions on that at all. Well, I knew we was going to forget one, and we forgot Bug Buster. Ooh, we need to Bug about Buster that. Is, is the sister to Bug Buster 2, but Bug Buster is an organic control. Well, now... Now, the regular Bug Buster. The re that's correct. The Bug Buster O is the, Bug the Buster o organic. is the organic. And it's just nothing but 1.4% natural pyrethrins, period. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have... It's not a synthetic. Now, that Bug Buster 2 is a synthetic product. But the reason I like to sell that product, especially here in the southeast, is you've got a lot of that that pyrethroid family that's out there that people have been using for a long period of time. And what you were talking about a while ago, uh, a lot of things become resistant to it. This is just a, not to get real technical about it, but if people are familiar with Asana XL on the ag side, this is actually the same active ingredient. Asana XL on the ag side is being used heavily. In the, uh, in the ag industry is a great insecticide because it kills so many things. But this is just a diluted formulation that we were able to, to formulate and sell across the counter to the homeowner to use. If you're growing cow peas, this is what you want to grow to spray your cow peas to keep them get stung up. That's correct. That is the cat's meow, as we say. That's right it. That's it. And yep. the good thing about that is, is in, and the reason I like the claim that that is a complete insect control it's got so many insects on there. It works on worms and caterpillars. It works on hard bodies insects like the stink bug, the cow pea cuculeo. Even they get grasshoppers if they're small. Will, if they're they small. That's right. And it works on uh, pretty, and, and your soft bodied insects like your aphids mm -hmm. and your white flies. It's got a label on there for fire ants. It's got a label on there for, uh, for ticks, fleas. It's just got a label on pretty much for everything. Mm -hmm. And it does have a vegetable label. It does have a fruit label and it does have a berry label and you can spray it in lawn and you spray it around your barn, around outside of your house. But it's real easy to use. It's one ounce per gallon and it has a real good informative, like I was talking about a while ago, it's got a good informative label on there. For instance, if you've got peppers, it's seven days withdrawal. If you've got tomatoes, it's one day withdrawal. If you've got uh, squash, it's like three days. It's got a label on there to tell you all the vegetables that you grow pretty much on the Do you remember what the reharvest interval time is on those? What, say if I spray Bug Buster 2, how long before I can harvest? Do you remember what that, that is? That, is that, on that withdrawal period, it, it's going to be either one day. Okay. It's going to be one day. Most of all of it is one to seven days. Okay. And on the Nemo, I'm assuming that's one day. Pretty that much. Same one day. Yes. Yep. You can do that. You can spray today and harvest tomorrow. All right. So that is tomato, pepper, insect, mite, and fungus. We're going to talk about worms a little bit different because these different products we need to hit with the worms. So let's move into the worms. We're going to leave the Bug Buster 2 there, but we're going to get a, another product out here that is a favorite of mine right there. And that's the one you talked about just a minute ago. Now, people pronounce that different all over the country. They do. I call it spinosad. Yeah, well, it, it's, <laughs> it's really spelled spinosad. Yeah. Some people call it spinosad, and, yeah. but it is spinosad. But that is that, that's the, I'm not saying that's the first one that I can remember, but I think that is, well, BT would have been the first one. And we'll briefly talk about that one too. But but the garden insect spray, the, the uh, sp uh, spinosad is just so much better because there's such a broader spectrum of insects it kills. Mm -hmm. It not only kills uh, worms and caterpillars, it works on thrips and uh, mites and leaf, uh, not leaf hoppers, but uh, it works on leaf uh, boars and leaf mm -hmm. miners. Yep. Works on several different things, but it's a, and again, what you said a while ago about the complete disease, there's, we have not, they nothing's developed a resistance to it mm -hmm. and it's done a good job and it is it's a it's a bio insecticide and that's the reason it's used in ag com, uh, community wells when kind of has no resistance that's so the, the commercial farmers use this within their rotation simply because they don't have that resistance that's in there right. and they can pepper that's it in you know this is to me probably my favorite go-to on the organic insecticides right here if there's one thing it'll draw back, it can't hurt your beneficials just a little bit. This is what I normally recommend and right. see if you agree with me. I start off with neem, right. and then I kind of work up and I use this later on in my program as my insect pressure gets heavier and heavier. And if you got worms, probably go ahead and go to this right here. That's great. But that's a great product right there as far as organic controls. It's a fermented product, if I remember correctly. It, it is. It actually, that was the one we were talking about a little earlier that, uh, that they, 
I don't know if you could say they developed it. They really found out what it, what it did in 1985 was when they first announced that. And it actually was derived from a, a bacteria that was growing in an old rum factory. Hmm. And I want to say it was Puerto Rico. It was one of the Virgin Islands or one of the islands down there in the Caribbean. And uh, it, it just, it done a good job and they started using it. How it in the world do they find that? I have no clue. <laughs> It's about like all these people that develop a lot of these synthetic products too, but now yeah. this one here is one that is natural, and, and I guess that you would say that's probably, in the lawn and garden industry overall, I would say that was probably, BT was the first, this was the second, and then of course the uh, complete disease, the biofungicide's been the, been the third. Yep. But, but all three of those do a great and job. And these are stomach poisons, so they have to consume this right here for to kill the worm. Yeah, that has that has a little bit of contact on oh, it, it but it... But now, like on BT, it has to be ingested. Right. And, and we'll go ahead and talk about that BT a little bit. The difference in this and BT, and BT has been around since, I think, the, I want to say the 60s. I've been around right. for a it's while. It's been around a long time. Same thing as diaper. And look here, folks. If you've got cabbage loopers in your broccoli and stuff like that still, that's a great product. It's a great product. Too. It is. But if you've got a, a little bit more problem, like I said, that does nothing but worms and caterpillars, mm -hmm. period. But this one here, the garden insect spray, actually kills a lot of other insects to go along with Yeah, it, so. so the only time I really use BT is on my brassicas. Okay. And I rotate it with spinosad is what I do on that right there. Right. I don't use it too much on my tomatoes and peppers and stuff like that. I mainly just use spinosad. That's right. There you go. So you got that you got those worm products right here. Now this one right here is one when you see these worms and you got worm problem and you need to correct it quickly, you want to go with the bug buster too. Yeah. yeah, if you've got an infestation that you need to handle quickly, it's gonna take care of it quickly. Uh, that's gonna be a better one. And that bug buster oh you've got now. We didn't bring one of those up here, but that's actually all natural pyrethrins and you really can't hardly beat a strong all natural pyrethrin like that for a quick knockdown. Oh, I mean, absolutely. It, it, there's no residual to it at all. But when you spray it and you get it on the bugs, it's gonna knock them out and it's gonna knock them out quickly. I got all kinds of notes here we got to get through. We got some good stuff today. All right, let's move into the garden bean program real quick. Okay. And let's get out here. Uh, we got Fungamax. Let's get it back out because we talked about it for rust control on beans. This is that's it right great. here. That's got a good rust. Uh, and we're going to talk about complete disease control for beans. And that one works good on rust. And again, this one earlier in the season. And if you get a really bad, you know, if you start seeing, not a bad problem, if you start seeing more rust, you may want to go with the Fungimax because it is a systemic. But uh, What about powdery mildew on beans? It, uh, it, Fungamax? Yeah, that works. That okay. works too. And this one does too. Both of those will. Both okay, but we got, you got your organic covered That's and right. we got your synthetic covered. All right, so we're going to get Bug Buster 2 back out. That's going to be right here. Oh, I still got yep. it. And what else are we going to get here? Monterey Takedown. Yep. And, and again, that Bug Buster 2 has got a great P label on there. And it is the only thing that, that one of the only products available to, to home gardeners that does have that Calpe Cuculio and stink bugs, and you can spray it on vegetables. Bug Buster 2. Bug Buster 2, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now, takedown is going to be a, a little bit different, but it's uh, it's an organic also. Uh, but it's going to be, uh, what I like to tell you a while ago about those natural pyrethrins, that's what that's got in it for a quick knockdown. But it has canola oil, and that's just something that's been being used in it. Uh, in the ag industry quite a good bit because it's a safe product, and it's got about a five, maybe four to six day residual with it so it, it actually the pyrethrin is going to do the quick knockdown and then the uh, canola oil is going to give you a little bit of residual with it. And this is going to make the pyrethrin a little bit hotter as a catalyst, correct? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. That is correct. Yeah, a good product right here is this takedown right here. Um, if you if you want to control something naturally, that is a great one right there to go with before you have to get into the bug buster. That's too, correct. Right That's correct. And again, withdrawal period on that one's you know, next day, but with the bug buster too, you're going to have a little bit of a Little bit of waiting time. All right, so we got beans covered here. The same thing will pretty much go with uh, peas. Peas and beans, we kind of group that together there or not? You could. Okay. Because it's basically yeah. the same it, kind it, of disease as insects run into. That is correct. All right. That is correct. Let's move into one right here we've not covered before fruit tree spray. <clears throat> See what we need to get out here. We need to get horticultural oil. Surely we got horticulture oil. Yep. Yep. I think we did bring that we in. We got horticulture oil. I might put my glasses on. Liquid cop. We ain't even talked about liquid cop. Yeah. 
Liquid cop can also be used with, with these products here on that rust. That also does have rust on the labels. These are the better ones, but some people prefer the copper because it does have a rust on the label. And guard fossils. And you know one of the little secrets about, uh, about rust on beans, don't you? No. You know, that uh, all that's going to be heavy water on top. Yep. If you water, if you start, if you know you're going to have a rust, you, you start seeing a rust problem, go ahead and start, you know, of course, do a maintenance program. But spray and uh, just make sure you water. Drip uh, irrigation. That's exactly drip right. irrigation. That's the best thing. <laughs> that's right, drip irrigation. Yeah. All right, so fruit tree spray, something that we've not covered on the show a lot because it's really not something that I am, uh, I know some about it, but I'm no expert in it. We've got Wendell here, so we've well, had a good time expert. to talk and about fruit tree spray. Because some of you need to be doing now. Yes, absolutely. Well, the program that uh, I guess you've got that up on the screen, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, you, you definitely need to, growing fruit trees is pretty much a year round thing. In the fall, you gotta make sure that you get that, uh, that over summering and over, I guess, over a growing season, insects and all, but it's a good time to prune in that latter part of the year, in the fall. And uh, then as it sets, you know, spray, with a liquid cop mix and a hort mix, and what that does basically is take care of your fungicide, I mean your funguses, and that also takes care of any of your existing insects. So you want to spray those trees, you want to spray your bark good, everything. every little crevice. Everything. Because we have an insect called scale that will overwinter in those cracks of the bark, and that's where a horticulture oil comes in, it goes in there and gets those mites and scales that, out of there. That is correct. And our liquid cop works on our things such as blight. That's that's correct. And all those ugly diseases. So right here is folks, you got those peach plum trees. Right. This is your first mix right here to hit it. Yeah. And, it. And if you've got a problem, if you know you've had a problem with peach leaf curl, which is really hard to control, that you've got to get that copper on them in the fall. You need to get an application in the fall. And, and then an early winter application. That's, that's yeah. correct. An early winter application also. Which and would the be good now. Thing, and the good thing about those two products right there, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with an old product called lime sulfur spray. Mm -hmm. It's not available anymore. People loved it because it was it really, it was really inexpensive but it did a great job as a dormant spray and uh, people use that and that's gone. They don't manufacture it anymore, but we found that both of those products right there mixed together, one, uh, one ounce of each of those in a gallon of water makes us basically the same type of product that that lime sulfur, it does the same thing basically lime sulfur did. Right. And those are compatible. You can mix that hoard oil pretty much with anything but the liquid cop and the hoard oil mixed together. Same right. thing as far as heat restrictions. Although we can spray this horticulture all during the day, prefer to spray this early in the morning, late in the afternoon. I know this is a refined product and I know right. it's pretty well safe just from my standpoint. That's I always I mean, absolutely, that's not a problem at all. I, the, the good thing about the hoard oil, if you, in the, in the summertime, if you've got some late crops and it's 100 degrees in the daytime down here or 105 and it, it don't cool down at night till, you know, till 85 or 90 degrees, you get a little concerned about spraying things because it can burn the foliage. That one there has no, that hoard oil is a 80% mineral oil with 20% emulsifiers. It does not burn. So you won't have no burning problem whatsoever. In a liquid cop, you, you might could get a little bit of burn if you put it out there when it's really hot so you don't have to mix those together. But as far as an insecticide in the summer, mm -hmm. you can't beat that hoard oil. Well, it, it takes care of most all your soft bodied insects by suffocation and you do have to get it on the, on the insect. But just make sure you spray up top of the leaf and on the bottom of the leaf and on all the stalk and just get a good thorough coverage. All right, we're moving in early spring now. Right. Early spring, we've got garden foss and liquid cop. We're gonna mix those two together. Okay. Correct? Well, well you don't have to now. Really, that what you need to be spraying for after, and we need after the buds break. Disease control yeah. over there too. After the buds break, you wanna make sure that the only, really the only thing you need to be spraying there at time is garden foss because that's for fire blight. And that's where, that's the best time to spray it. And get on the program where you're spraying it at least once every four weeks, follow your spray and throughout the growing season. And if you folks have got pears out there, any kind of pear tree, more likely you have seen fire blight on it. That's right. Yeah, that's correct. That is correct. So, so we got three different fungicide products here to use in the springtime. Now you would use each one of them differently in a different spray solution, correct? That is correct. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Maybe on like a seven to ten day rotation there. Yeah, and I wouldn't. You're probably not going to go over ten days because okay. especially on your fungicides, because you've got to keep that fungicide on there as a maintenance for sure. I mean, it's got to. You you don't want to have a problem. So if you keep it under under guard, because like the old saying goes, you know, uh, 
an ounce of uh, preventative is worth the pound to cure. Absolutely. You, you, you want to you maintain them. All right, so let me get everything together here for our spring and summer spray. We got uh, garden insect spray. All right, so here we go right here. This is the three that we want to use for our spring and summer. Am I right? That is correct. All that right. is correct. So these right here are our insecticides. Yeah, not not this one, but those two. Right. Those two right there are. There you go. And I tell you, the, the good thing about our fruit tree spray is, is you get on a program with that, and that's after the uh, petals fall, and you can spray that one every uh, around every seven to 14 days. I know that's a wide window. It's probably going to be around that 10 day mark. Do that on a regular basis throughout the whole growing season because this right here is the same thing as a 70% anymore, but it also has pyrethrins in there for a quick knockdown. So if you've got just a few insects on the tree, uh, it'll knock them down, but it gives you a good residual. And again, that is part of a fungus, fu uh, a fungicide maintenance program too, because that does have fungicide properties. That's going to cover that leaf and protect it. That's correct. That is correct. Yeah. And, and then we one, got spinosad over here. Yep, and that's going to be for your worms. Later in the later in the season, you're going to start normally start seeing some worms, uh, and that'll take care of pretty much all your worms and your caterpillars. And it does work on the thrips and the leaf miners and the borers and and things like that. And you possibly going to have some bore problems. So the the spinosad works on that. So there you got an organic solution to all your insect problems on your fruit trees right there. Folks. That is correct. That the is key correct. to that is staying on top of it. That's it. That's it. And it and it honestly that I think that's the key to to growing most anything mm -hmm. is staying on top so of it. So what I do so the recommend recommendation on those two every seven days, correct? That's correct. So mm -hmm. what I do is I have a day of the week, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever, just have your one day of the week in my mind, that's what I got to spray my fruit right. trees, and that takes care of that instead of having to keep up with it. That's right. All right, as far as disease control goes, we go back to liquid cop here. The folks, this is one of the this is one of the best products right here for disease control. Been around for a long time, so we're back to this for our our disease control for our spring and summer applications. That's correct for our fruit trees. That is correct, and hopefully you'll have most of that taken care of. If not, you can still continue to use this one all the way up to harvest. This one has a little bit of withdrawal, but not much. I mean, you can use it and you can harvest a couple of days. The fruit tree spray, the one good thing I like about that, it is neem oil plus the pyrethrin. So you're taking care of your mites, your insect, and your fungus, and you can harvest the, you can harvest the same day. So yep. no, no withdrawal on it at all. Yep. Well, I think we've covered it all. That was a lot of good information there. Got a, oh, we got corn we got to talk about. Real quick, we got to do corn. All right, corn, and you brought up something that I didn't know. You talk about earwigs on corn. We're talking about sweet corn. Right. Let's move some of this side away. We got, we got insect spray, garden insect spray. Where's that? Uh, right. right here. Right there. No, that's garden fossil. No, right. I'm sorry, excuse me. Yep, there we go. We're trying to read the back of that thing. <laughs> there we go. There. So that one right there, you talk about that <clears throat> just meant for earwigs. I didn't, I never really had a problem with corn earwigs before. The spinosad is what does it. Mm -hmm. it, it just it, it'll take care of uh, of earwigs and earwigs is you know it, over here it may not be that big of a deal it, in some areas of the country in the southeast earwigs are hard to deal with. We know that you have the corn earworm. That's the big. That's the biggest issue. That's the that's biggest, the biggest for issue. Us. So if you want to do the corn earworm, we got two solutions for you right here. That's correct. That is correct. You can do the synthetic, which this is going to work on your corn corn uh, earworms. And this one will too, but you need to make sure when that corn starts tasseling and when you start seeing the silk pop out of that ear of corn, you need to start directly, especially those two areas, you've got to spray them good. Now for earwigs, you can spray the whole the whole stalk as it grows once you once the stalk appears. But now on the, the corn uh, earworm, you want to make sure that you spray it directly into that silk. Uh, you know, on the silk and in the silk. So on the spinosad, you go through there and spray just the silk on the on the corn. That's it. Okay. You don't have to. I mean, you're gonna cover some other parts of the corn, which is no problem at all. It's, but you just don't need to drinch the plant down. There's nothing right. to. No so on to. the bug buster too, what I've done in the past is shoot over the top and let it come down, just fog down, down. And that's fine. And you so can you, do this either way. You can. What they're trying to, I think the biggest deal is they don't want you to, to waste the product by spraying the whole plant because mm -hmm. you don't have to. Don't worry about the stalks and the, the leaves and things like that, but you do want to make sure that you get it because that's where your moss 
are going to be. They're going, they're going to be on that silk. They're drawn to that silk and they're drawn to that tassel. Well, with the spin of sand, you're not worried about getting that on you. So if you walk yeah. into your corn crop, you get some of this on you, it's a safe it's product. It's safe, very so then, safe. On the Bug Buster 2, however, I don't know that I do that. I probably would prefer to go over the top of it because I don't want to be in there getting it all over. That's fine. That is correct. That is correct. That's correct. And you know, what's more aggravating to grow in a good corn crop and the worms eating it up? And it's going to happen in the southeast if you yep. don't do something about it. <laughs> to prevent Some it from years happening. I have more pressure than I do other years, right. but uh, if I start seeing some damage, especially some eating on the leaves, right. I know I got to get something out there. Yeah, because a lot of times you won't see it in that ear of corn until you it's shut too it. late. It's yep. too late. So yep. you got to make sure you do something out. You know, in the past, before we got this product, a lot of people used BT. BT is a good product. I ain't going to say it's not. It but will it work. does not work on corn earworm. No, but this one is the best one. There's yep. no doubt about it. And it'll work on some worms and caterpillar varieties, but uh, that one right there is the better one for sure. Yep. For sure. All right, folks. So we've covered a lot for you. One more thing real quick here. These yellow sticky traps right here. These things, I know they got a rose on them right there, but they can be used in your vegetables, in your greenhouses right here. And this is a great one to put out there in your garden to monitor where you at on, on your insects, your beetle population, things like that. You can catch them, see what you got an issue there, aphids, thrips, whatever, you know. And it can be used as a control situation in the greenhouse That's or right. whatever. That's exactly but right. these things are inexpensive here and it's a great way to monitor your green, I mean, your garden out there to make sure what kind of problems you got. And then you can address them with some of these products right here. That's, That's right. Sticky traps. All right, we covered a lot of info there. Maybe that'll, maybe that'll help folks understand a little bit. Don't be intimidated by these products here. Just a little bit of, of uh, education on them will help you. I'm gonna show one thing real quick. Y'all see that right there? That word right there says caution. See if we can zoom in on that right there. That's a signal word for pesticides. When you see caution on that jug, that means it's the most safe pesticide that there are these three different warning they call them signal words it's caution there's warning and there's danger and then they go in that order caution being the least toxic formulation of a pesticide warning being the second one and danger being the one we really don't want to use as, as homeowners right there but when you see caution there that means it's pretty safe to use i just want to give everybody that little there bit of go. information out there and don't be intimidated and one more thing we might want to mention about it on every one of our products that are organic if uh, a lot of people do research on the internet and look they want to make sure it's a certified organic this omri is yep. omri cert certified the right there it is. company and it is the the most recognized and well known in the country and if it has that on the label you can be guaranteed it is 100 percent organic we do have some green label products that do not have that on there that are we consider to be natural products or safe to use, but they just are not certified as organics. But it will have that little label on the front. And if you're an organic grower, that's correct. That's, that's you, important. You got to have that. For the homeowner, it's just good information to that's know, right. but it's not a necessity. But if you're growing organically, it definitely is. I remember when I was uh, in the distribution business that uh, you know people just didn't even pay any attention, to, and I didn't either. I didn't even think nothing about Omri. But as I got into other areas of the industry, I figured out that that is very important. And now it's extremely important to the consumer because a lot of them do research and they want to know. They want to they know for a fact it is an organic product. You synthetic. know, we go back and forth uh, on organic synthetic, and this is the truth, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, organic is fine. There's nothing wrong with organic. you got to treat organically different than you do synthetics. Organic is pretty much strictly as a preventative program out there. You got to spray it before you have the problem. You minimize your problem there when you do the organic program, and, and hopefully you don't have a, a curative problem. If you don't do any of that and you run into a problem that you need to cure, then you're gonna to have to dip over into the synthetic side. That's just That's the nature right. of the way things are. That's I can't. Right. I didn't make rules. I'm just telling you how it is. Well, so we're all we're all human, and if they like me, they they wait till they got a problem before they want to fix it. Yeah. And there's a whole lot easier ways to prevent that problem if you would just do what you're supposed to do. And I don't know yeah. the time. So, if you want to so grow organically, up. that's <laughs> fine, but just understand you're going to have to have a preventative program if you that's want right. to be successful. That's exactly right. Do it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Amen, brother. All right, so let's get into Garden of the Week. Folks, don't you like that a pretty garden right there? Yes, I wonder if you'll hold that up for I'll him be, just like that I'll right be. there. All right, folks, this is our Garden Spotlight of the Week, Zone 7. Amy Starnes out of Tennessee. 
And look up there at her humble raised bed. She says five in total. The arch, which I got to put Mama Hoss in one of those arches <laughs> right there. She's got all kind of melons there, cucumbers, all kind of kind of weird stuff there. And uh, you can't see her tomatoes, but she's got 49 varieties of tomatoes. 49. Wow. Peppers of all sorts, herbs, array of flowers. Man, she says she's itching to get it back outside and getting her elephant. Thank you, Amy, for sending that in. You know what? That's a pretty garden. It is a pretty garden. Yep. No doubt. And and thanks to you all for those arches that y'all put in. Now I got to put Mama Hoss one in. <laughs> you know, I got out there today. That's not going to be as easy a project as I thought it was going to be. But I'm going to do the same thing they did there. See how they got the middle fence post? I'm going to do the same thing. And you attach the hog wire there you go. to that metal fence post. She's already got laid out for me out there what I got to do. All right, folks, the old goat. So on the show here somewhere is the old goat figurine, and it's not me, it's a figurine. And if you see the old goat, put in the comments below where it's at. And next week, we'll have a drawing. This week's drawing, and I'll let Wendell draw it out All here. Right. Last week's winner of the old goat drawing is... Jerry Goodlidge. Jerry, send us your shipping information, shipping, yeah, your shipping address to custerhostools.com and you will be sent a pair of get dirty socks. It'll be the envy of the neighborhood, Wendell. Don't you think so? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, wear your Bermuda uh, shorts with I your big like old them. with your big old socks on right there, you get dirty socks here, and everybody be asking where'd you get those pretty socks at? <laughs> And you can tell them you want them from the old goat draw. All right, folks, thank you for joining us. I hope we helped you some. It was great having Wendell on the show here today. I always mm -hmm. love to sit and talk to Wendell because he's always giving me some information I didn't know. One thing with gardens, you're always learning. Oh, always. Hey, as old as, as, old as we are, we still learn everything. Still day. learning. We just keep our ears open. And as some people say, you mouth closed. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you all for joining us. Now it's time for you to get outside and get dirty.